So I'll first like to thank the organizers uh, for the invitation to present and you know, it's, it's really an honor to be here and the, the only part that kind of sucks is having to follow Laurie because that's, that's a hard act to follow. Um, and I'll, what I'll be presenting today is, is, is sort of not as developed as what Laurie presented. Uh, this is truly sort of a work in progress. Um, and, and it's sort of a slightly different topic than what you've been hearing. And, and what we're doing is, is looking at the a, a possible role for neuropeptides as a treatment for SCN1A derived epilepsy, but epilepsies in general. So, yeah. So again, you know, we've, we've you know, from yesterday to today, we've heard so many amazing sort of, you know, treatments coming down the pike that, that have the potential to really transform the way we treat kids with SCN1A mutations. In addition to all of the gene modif you know, the disease modifying therapies we heard, uh, you know, there have been a number of, 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 of AEDs which have been approved in the last few years, which are, which are really helping. But, but again, you know, even if you think about, the, you know, the presentation from Andreas this morning and gain-of-function SCN1A mutations, right? I mean, the more we look, the more we're going to find things that don't fit in the box. And so I think it's really important to always have, you know, as many tools as possible so that we could actually have therapies available for, for patients as they present with things we don't expect. So despite all the progress that's been made, I think there's still a lot, a lot of work to be done to identify additional compounds that could fit sort of the continuing unmet need. So along those lines, we, we got interested in, in neuropeptides. Um, and so, so why neuropeptides, right? So, so neuropeptides are, you know, again, you know, despite the available AEDs, I think everyone in this room will appreciate that they all have limitations and, and they often have, you know, difficult side effects to, to, to sort of manage as well as, you know, often we, we focus on the seizures and we, we don't pay as, as much attention to all of the behavioral challenges that these kids experience. And so I think there's a lot of room for, you know, to still develop treatments that, that could uh, equally sort of uh, address all the different aspects of Dravet. So, so neuropeptides are small uh, bioactive peptides. They are naturally made in the body. Today I'll be telling you a lot about oxytocin, which I think a lot of people are probably familiar with. You know, oxytocin is only nine amino acids long, so these are very small peptides that are synthesized in the body. But, but they're really amazing molecules, and, and they, they play a wide range of different biological functions. Uh, and, and we know that there's a whole alphabet soup of, of neuropeptides to choose from. There are over 100 different neuropeptides that are synthesized in the body, and, and some of them could actually alter uh, neuronal excitability. Some act on inhibition, some act on excitation. So again, I think there's sort of you know, a, whole, a whole chest of compounds we could potentially take advantage of. They also have, you know, they, they, they act by binding to their receptors, but different neuropeptides, the distribution of their, recepti, of their receptors in the brain is different. So some, some receptors are broadly distributed in the brain, some have more focal uh, expression, so again, you could sort of take advantage of the different properties of the neuropeptides and their corresponding receptors. And, and what was really appealing to us is that there's a lot of literature showing that neuropeptides can have a really profound effect on behavior. And so again, I'll be telling you about oxytocin uh, for most of the presentation. You know, oxytocin is known as sort of the love hormone because it's, a, in, it's involved in social behaviors. You know, it it's, plays a really important role during childbirth, during lactation. But, but, but again, these, these neuropeptides have diverse functions. And what I'll be showing you today is that uh, oxytocin actually also has an effect on excitability in the brain and, and actually can increase seizure resistance. So there's a whole, like I said, there are over 100 different neuropeptides uh, that are naturally made in the body. This is just a small list of, of some of them. And these are the ones perhaps where you know, the most research has, has been performed. But like I said, there, there, there are dozens more uh, neuropeptides that we can take advantage of. But neuropeptides themselves have, have two major disadvantages to both their clinical application as well as our attempts to do research on them. For one thing, they have really poor blood-brain barrier penetrance. So if you inject you know, a, a neuropeptide, very little of it will get into the brain because it can't cross the blood-brain barrier effectively. And also, they tend to have really short half-lives. So the half-life of oxytocin, for example, is about 20 minutes. 
So if you inject oxytocin, very little of it is gonna get into the brain and most of it will be gone in 20 minutes or more, right? So, so you know, to, to both, you know, try and improve the potential of these neuropeptides to be used clinically and also to facilitate research efforts with neuropeptides, we, we need a way to try and overcome these, these barriers. And again, I'll be telling you mainly about oxytocin and for most of the presentation. Right at the end, I'll, I'll show you some data with a couple other neuropeptides. But, but oxytocin itself, like I said at the beginning, it, it, it plays a really important role in promoting uh, social behavior, maternal behavior. Uh, and, and, and there's a lot of research on that aspect of, of the biology of oxytocin. But oxytocin also is neuroprotective. Uh, it increases neural inhibition. And from the talks today that you've heard on, on Dravet, you know that one of the one of the hallmarks of Dravet is that there's a reduced level of inhibition in the brain. So the ability of oxytocin to actually increase inhibition was also attractive. Oxytocin also has anti-inflammatory properties, which is really important in epilepsy, seizures cause inflammation in the brain. And so a molecule that has all of these properties is potentially sort of interesting and useful. There was a little bit of data supporting the potential of, of oxytocin to actually increase seizure resistance when we started this work. Uh, one of the early studies uh, shown here, I don't have a pointer, sorry, so. Uh, they looked at mice in which the oxytocin receptor had been knocked out, so oxytocin cannot bind to its receptor in these mice and exert its effect. And if you look at these graphs, uh, these animals, these mice were injected with a proconvulsant drug, and they looked on the left at the, the time for the first abnormal spike activity in the brain to start. The knockout mice are the black bars, so you can see that the, the time for the first spike generation in the knockout mice uh, was, was shorter, suggesting that these animals were more seizure susceptible. And on the right, it shows the number of spikes in a 30-minute period, and again in the black bar, you can see in the knockout animals that there were a lot more spikes. So, so if you knock out the oxytocin receptor so that oxytocin cannot bind, you basically abolish the function of oxytocin and, and these mice were more seizure susceptible. There were also a small number of studies where oxytocin had been actually administered to animals and, and, and these animals were looked at to see whether the administration of oxytocin will make them more seizure resistant or more seizure susceptible. And, and the results from these studies were, were largely conflicting and, and the data was not very robust. Uh, in a couple of these studies, there was evidence that the administration of oxytocin made the animals more seizure resistant, but, but, but again, the, the data was not very convincing. And we think part of the problem is that, you know, again, if you just look at those, the three different studies, some were in mice, some were in rats, uh, oxytocin was administered via different routes in those studies. And if you remember that you know, most oxytocin, if injected, does not get into the brain. It means that in these studies, probably very little oxytocin actually entered into the brain. So, so we decided to sort of, you know, start from scratch and, and ask, well, if we could carefully administer oxytocin directly into the brain in sort of a well-designed study, would we see evidence that it might be seizure protective? And so that's what we did, and that's what's shown here. So in this experiment, this, we're injecting oxytocin directly into the brain. This is just in wild-type mice. It's not in, any, it's not in a sodium channel model. But what we're showing here is a, is a dose response, okay? And, and in Cameron's presentation this morning from the anti-convulsant screen, he mentioned one of the methods they use is 6 hertz. So I'll be showing you a lot of 6 hertz data. So let me just explain what, what this is. So in, in this particular experiment, it's, it's, it's a... It's a, it's a paradigm in which we look at seizure susceptibility in the mice. It's an electrically induced seizure where the mice are administered a slight current which causes them to maybe have a seizure or not, okay? And, and we, we, we score the response of the mice. So a zero on the y-axis, the zero means that the animal did not seize, okay? And then as the number increases, it means that the, the response severity increased, right? So in an ideal experiment, if you administer the six hertz method and all of your mice are protected, then they should all have a score of zero, 
Okay, if they have a score of one, then they have a mild response, and then the response increases as the number increases. So you can see here that if we just administer saline to these mice, so just you know, sodium chloride, it's, it's not a drug, all of the mice in this particular experiment had a score of two, okay? As we increase uh, the concentration of oxytocin shown on the bottom going from left to right, at a dose of one microgram directly into the brain, we didn't change anything, right? All of the mice still had a score of two. But as we increased the dose and we got to a dose of about 10 micrograms, we began to see protection in the mice. So, so three of the mice did not have a seizure, and the ones that did seize had a score of one, so it was less severe than the two that we normally see. And as you typically see with drugs, as you further increase the dose, you begin to lose the protective effect. So at a dose of 20, then again we're seeing seizures in the mice. It's no longer protective, right? So it's a dose response curve showing that around 10 micrograms directly into the brain, uh, oxytocin seems capable of uh, uh, increasing resistance to these seizures. So then we thought, well, okay, it, it worked, or it seemed to work in, in wild-type mice. What about in a sodium channel in an SCN1A mutant uh, model? And so that's what's shown here. On the left, the WT refers to wild types, so those are the wild-type litimates. They do not have the SCN1A mutation. And then the animals on the right with the RH slash plus, they express a human SCN1A mutation. It's a mouse model that my lab generated several years ago, and we've done a lot of work with it. So the animals on the right are the sodium channel mutants, and, and the ones on the left are the wild types. Under these conditions, under the current we use, the wild type litimates do not seize, okay? The SCN1A mice are seizure susceptible, so at this current they seize, their wild type litimates do not seize. So you can see on the left that, you know, we had two controls, ones that just got the surgery, so they had the needle uh, going into the brain to deliver oxytocin, but nothing was delivered. The ones with saline got saline and, and no oxytocin, and then the OT stands for oxytocin, so those ones got oxytocin directly into the brain. The wild-type mice do not seize, so the surgery and the saline controls had zeros, and when we gave those mice oxytocin, they still had a zero, so at least oxytocin was not causing them to have a seizure. If you look at the mutant mice to the right, you'll see that all of the ones that just had the surgery had a seizure when we gave them the six hertz uh, paradigm. Just injecting saline into their brains didn't do anything. They still had a, a class two seizure. But the ones that got oxytocin, most of them had a zero. So in the mutant mice as well, in introducing oxytocin directly into the brain was seizure protective. It was able to increase their resistance to the seizure. So we thought, okay, that was promising, right? But obviously injecting oxytocin directly into the brain is not that clinically irrelevant. So, so the next challenge was, could we develop a strategy where we could more, we, in a more clinically relevant manner, deliver oxytocin and have it get into the brain? So for this, we, we began to collaborate with, with, with some collaborators at Mercer University, which is uh, just about 20 minutes from Emory University where I work. And, and we turned our attention to the use of nanoparticles. So nanoparticles are, are small particles. Uh, they're typically less than 200 nanometers in size, so they're sort of microscopic. Uh, there are a whole bunch of different polymers that can be used to create the nanoparticle. And actually in cancer research, there's a lot of work going on with the use of nanoparticles to deliver drugs to the tumor itself. And one of the other advantages of, of nanoparticles for work like what we were thinking about is that you could, on the outside of the nanoparticle itself, you can add a number of different chemical modifications that allows you to take advantage of receptors on the blood-brain barrier to enable the drug that, that's inside the nanoparticle to actually be transported into the brain. So we thought that this was a promising strategy, potential strategy, for encapsulating oxytocin within this nanoparticle and then helping it to get into the brain without having to directly inject it into the brain. So in early work, and this has all been published by our collaborators, we tested a number of different types of material that we can use to create the nanoparticle itself. And, and we compared two different materials. We compared BSA or bovine serum albumin and then another one called PLGA, and, and both of these are biocompatible nanoparticles. They're used clinically. 
And we found that at least in our hands, uh, the, the empty bars on the top in that graph uh, is looking at the release of, of the nanoparticle of, of oxytocin from within this nanoparticle over time. And we found that when the oxytocin was encapsulated in BSA nanoparticles, there was a faster release. And so we, 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 were, we, we found that to be a more favorable property. And so we pursued BSA as the material that we use for the nanoparticle. Uh, again, to facilitate entry of this nanoparticle into the brain and help it cross the blood-brain barrier, we conjugated a, a sort of a chemical uh, arm on the surface of the, of the nanoparticle. Uh, and we use, in this case, rabies virus glycoprotein, or RVG. So we have this BSA-made polymer, right? That's the nanoparticle. The surface of the nanoparticle is coated with, with RVG. And that the RVG on this outside uses a, uses a receptor on the blood-brain barrier to allow the nanoparticle to enter into the brain. Okay, and we saw that in the, if you look at the graph on the, on the left, so that is uh, looking at the release of oxytocin from the nanoparticle. And we actually saw there were sort of two phases. There was that, the, almost the vertical line. There was a, a quick initial release and then a more sustained release, uh, which was a very favorable property that we were sort of hoping to see. And then on the right, it shows actually the level of oxytocin in the CSF. So the, the graph on the left is just uh, an in vitro data. It's just in, in a cellular assay. The graph on the right is actually in mice. So the graph on the, on the right is showing this nanoparticle encapsulated preparation of oxytocin that we call NPOT. And you'll see that name used for the rest of the presentation. So NP for nanoparticle and OT for oxytocin. And this is looking at the concentration of oxytocin, oxytocin in the CSF when the mice inhale this preparation. Okay, so we're, we're delivering it intranasally in the mice. Uh, really low-tech strategy. We basically put small drops right on the tip of the nose and the mouse just inhales it. And then we look at the concentration of oxytocin in the CSF following this. And we compared the NPOT preparation to if we just gave free oxytocin, so not inside a nanoparticle, just droplets of oxytocin on the nose. And you can see with the NPOT preparation, we see a much higher concentration of oxytocin in the plasma, showing that this nanoparticle encapsulated preparation is really getting into the brain and then getting into the, sorry, into the CSF and then into the CSF. So we have this formulation, right? It, it looks like it's able to increase uh, the entry of oxytocin in the brain, so can this protect the mice, right? That, that was sort of the big question. So we began to ask that in the next few slides. So this is now work uh, using our SCN1A mouse model. And, and we looked in this graph. So in, in, so in this experiment, uh, let me just walk you through it. Again, this is the same 6 hertz data I showed before, where we're going to give the mice a 6 hertz seizure, and we're going to score their behavior. Zero means they did not seize, so they were protected. One, two, and three means they had a, a response and increasing severity. WT are the wild type litimates. The SCN1A, RH, slash, plus are the mutant animals. Okay. Again, at this current, the wild type mice do not seize. And you can see we, we treated the mice uh, three different ways. Empty means we gave them the nanoparticles, but they did not contain oxytocin. So they were just the empty nanoparticle. Free means we gave them just free oxytocin, not inside a nanoparticle. And then NPOT is our nanoparticle encapsulated preparation. So you can see that the wild type mice, as you would expect, they did not seize because they don't seize in this paradigm. And giving the wild type mice NPOT did not cause them to have a seizure, so that was good. Uh, looking at the SC and 1A mice, we first looked at them 20 minutes after administering this preparation. And if you go across the SC and 1A tree uh, columns, you will see all of the mice that got the empty nanoparticles, so they were not filled with oxytocin. All of those mice had a class two seizure, which is what we expect in this paradigm. When we gave them free oxytocin, you can see there are two mice on the x-axis that did not seize, so even free oxytocin, enough of it in a couple mice was probably able to get into the brain and protect them. 
uh, but most of the mice that got the NPOT preparation did not seize. Most of them had a zero. That was 20 minutes after administering the, the nano, th these different treatments. We repeated the assay on the same mice six hours later. And there again, if you look at the, gr on the, gra the graph on the right, you'll see again all of the wild type mice, none of them had a seizure. If you look at the SCN1A mice, you will see all of the MT treated mice had a class two seizure as they did at 20 minutes. This time, all of the, free, all of the mice that got free oxytocin had a seizure. So those two mice that were initially protected at 20 minutes now had a seizure as well. But if you look at the animals that got NPOT, again, most of them had a zero. There was one that had a mild seizure, one, and then a couple that had a two. So again, we were really encouraged by these results because if you remember, I said the half-life of oxytocin is 20 minutes, right? We're looking at six hours after administering this preparation. So, so what we believe is that the protection we see at 20 minutes, which is really fast, and that's the earliest we've looked at up to now, probably comes from oxytocin that's coated the outside of the nanoparticle. And then once it gets into the brain, over time it gets released from the inside of the nanoparticle. And so you get this sustained protection. So we think that the preparation uh, improves the blood-brain barrier penetrance of oxytocin and also provides sort of sustained release and sustained protection in these mice. And in fact, in some mice, if we, if we dose them high enough, we were able to see protection three days after administration of this preparation. So, you know, as long as you can get enough into the brain, it, it slowly comes out of the nanoparticle and provides protection. We also looked at the ability of this preparation to protect against seizures induced by other methods, and this is one example here. This is uh, seizures induced by a chemiconvulsant called PTZ, so you inject PTZ, and then the mice will typically have a seizure. And what you time is how long it takes for the animals to have that seizure. And again, this is comparing the wild-type litimates, which are the WT, to the SCN1A mice, which is the RH slash plus. And this is sort of the latency of, of the animals to have a generalized tonic-clonic seizure. And what you're hoping to see is when you treat the animals, you can shift those graphs to the right, which means it's taking them a longer time to have the seizure. And that's, what I, that's exactly what we see with the animals treated with NPOT. For example, if you look at the wild-type mice, those are the ones in the purple graphs. The dashed line is when, uh, sorry, the wild types are the, are the, uh, the black solid lines. Uh, sorry, the, the wild type MT is the black solid line, and then the purple solid line is the wild type on NPOT. So you can see that we're able to really shift that bar to the, that, that graph to the right. And then similarly, the, the, uh, the SCN1A mice are the dashed lines. The black dashed line to the far left uh, is when you just have empty nanoparticles given to the SCN1A mice. And then the purple dashed line uh, to the right is when they have the NPOT. So for both the wild type mice and the SCN1A mice, when they are administered this NPOT intranasally, it increases the length of time it takes for them to have a seizure. And, you know, again, I've, you know, we've been focusing on SCN1A, but there are also mutations in other sodium channels that cause, SC, that cause uh, epilepsy. Uh, one of the other sodium channels we work with is SCN8A, and we tested this preparation as well in the SCN8A mutant mice, sort of doing the same thing, the 6 hertz paradigm after intranasal administration. Like I showed before, WT are the wild-type litimates. In this case, the RL slash plus are the SCN8A mice. And you could see, again, if you just look at the SCN8A mice to the right, the ones that just get the empty nanoparticles, all of them had a class two seizure. The ones that got the NPOT, most of them were protected. So again, in both an SCN1A model and an SCN8A model, this preparation was able to increase the resistance of the mice. Whoops. So I, I sort of said in the beginning, right, one of the advantages we think of these neuropeptides is that often they could have a profound effect on behavior and might potentially have the, the ability to improve some of the behavioral challenges in patients and kids with, with SCN1A mutations and other types of epilepsy. So one of the things we were really interested to look at was social behavior because oxytocin is no, known to play a really important role in social behavior. So in this particular paradigm, we're looking at uh, the social behavior of the mice. 
And, and this, is a, a, this was actually shown this morning. Uh, it's a paradigm where you, on the left, you look at the sociability of the animals. So you have a test mouse that has the choice of exploring either an inanimate object or another mouse. And because mice are social, the normal response should be that they spend more time exploring a mouse than an inanimate object. And so again, using the same sort of naming, the WT are the wild type litimates, RH are the SC and 1A mice. If you look sort of at the last two pairs of bars on, on the left-hand graph, those are the results from the SC and 1A mice. So you can see if we just give the SC and 1A mice the RH plus, just the empty nanoparticles, and allow them to explore either an inanimate object or a mouse, that they do not spend a statistically significant difference in the length of time exploring either the inanimate object or another mouse. But when we give them NPOT, which is the last pair on, the, on that left graph, we see a significantly longer amount of time spent exploring the mouse rather than the object, which is what you expect for normal behavior. So this NPOT preparation was able to restore sort of normal sociability behavior in, in the SC and 1A mice. In the graph on the right, we're looking at another aspect, which is social discrimination, where this mouse now has the chance, has the choice to explore a familiar mouse, a mouse it already knows, or a novel mouse. And again, the normal response, because mice are, are attracted to sort of social novelty, should be that a significantly lo longer amount of time is spent exploring the novel mouse versus a familiar mouse. It already knows the familiar mouse. It will rather spend time exploring the novel mouse. Again, if you focus on the two pairs on the, on the right, in that right-hand graph, at the RH plus mice, you can see that when RH mice were just given the empty nanoparticles, they show a deficit in this social discrimination because they do not spend a significantly longer amount of time exploring the novel versus familiar mouse. But in the very last pair of bars, when we give them NPOT, uh, they do spend a much longer length of time exploring the novel versus the familiar mouse. So again, this preparation was able to restore more normal social behaviors in the mice. And you know, it's really important when you're doing work like this, right? We're, we're, we're administering a nanoparticle to these animals. It's getting into their brain it's important to make sure that we're not eliciting any sort of adverse effects. So one of the things we look at is for evidence of toxicity is uh, we allow the mice to run on a rotor rod, on a, on a rotating wheel, and we measure the length of time it takes for them to fall. If you see them falling faster, it probably means that there was some sort of toxicity. Uh, in this case, you can see whether we give them vehicle, MT or the NPOT, there was no difference, so we're not eliciting any sort of neurotoxic effect. And we also looked at uh, a number of different inflammatory markers in the brain after five days of administering this preparation to see if there was any evidence of the preparation itself causing inflammation in the brain, and we did not see any. So, so the preparation seems to be well tolerated, and we did not see any evidence of adverse effects in the animals. Uh, you know, in another study, we, we were interested to know what is the mechanism by which this NPOT preparation is working. Oxytocin binds to two different receptors. It binds to the oxytocin receptor, but it also binds to the vasopressing receptor. And we were interested to know which receptor we were getting this effect acting through. And so I, I'm not showing the, vasopress the data with the vasopressing, vasopressing receptor because it, it was not the vasopressing receptor. Uh, in this experiment here, we, we blocked the oxytocin receptor, which is sort of the two pairs to the far right of this graph, where you see, where you see saline plus NPOT. So there we give the mice NPOT and saline, and we ask, can we protect against the seizure? And you can see that all of those mice had a zero, except one, so it was protecting the mice. If we block the oxytocin receptor itself, which is the very last uh, column on the right, uh, we completely lose that protection because all of the mice now have a two. So when we block the oxytocin receptor, we lose the protective effect. So, so this, this preparation is acting through the oxytocin receptor. So, you know, I, I, the data shows at least that this way of preparing the neuropeptide, encapsulating it within this nanoparticle, uh, increases its ability to enter into the brain 
and, and allows it to both increase seizure resistance and restore more normal social behavior in the SC and 1A mice. So, you know, what about other neuropeptides, right? I said there are over 100 neuropeptides. So in the last few slides, I'm just gonna show you some very preliminary data. These are slides I grabbed from the guys in my lab on my way out to the airport. Uh, so we've also recently started looking at a couple other neuropeptides. Uh, so one that we're sort of interested in is called neuropeptide S. Again, this one has been shown in, in other studies to decrease anxiety and also to improve memory performance. So again, we thought that these are, these are sort of behavioral modifications that could be important in the context of epilepsy. And then another neuropeptide, neuropeptide Y, which actually there is a literature on neuropeptide Y being seizure protective. But again, all of those studies are based on having to inject it directly into the brain. So for both of these neuropeptides, we did the same thing. We encapsulated them inside the nanoparticle the same way and uh, doing the same six hertz seizure induction uh, paradigm I showed you before. This is some data looking at uh, neuropeptide S, so NP, NPS, uh, nanoparticle encapsulated NPS. On the left, there's a dose response curve like I showed for oxytocin, where we either give empty nanoparticles or an increasing amount of NP, uh, NPS. And you can see at 80 micrograms, we get no protection, right? All of the mice have a class two seizure. As we increase the dose, we begin to see protection. And then with the highest dose of like 360 micrograms uh, and even 240 micrograms, most of the mice are protected, they have a zero, okay? We repeated this in a, in a larger cohort of uh, animals at the 240 microgram uh, concentration. And you could see in this particular experiment, all of the mice that got the MP and PS were protected. They all had a zero. Uh, in another seizure induction paradigm with, with PTZ-induced seizures, again with the NP and PS, we see a really nice rightward shift in that graph in the latency to have the seizure. The red graph being the animals that got the NP and PS. Again, this is being intranasally administered. And then in the last uh, slide, uh, one slide on, on NPY, we've only just started doing these experiments. We've encapsulated NPY the same way in a nanoparticle again, so we have NP, NPY. Uh, the graph on the left is a dose response where we increase the dose and we do the six hertz seizure uh, paradigm again. And you can see as the dose is increasing, we have more animals having a zero. And then uh, the graph on the right is a repeat where we just compared one dose, in this case the 100 micrograms, animals that got either the empty nanoparticles or the NP, NPY preparation. And again, much more animals that had the NPY preparation had a zero. So again, a different neuropeptides packaged in a similar way. Uh, again, we're helping with their entry into the brain and uh, showing that they are seizure protective. So just to summarize, uh, you know, we've shown that oxytocin might be therapeutic uh, as a treatment for epilepsy and, and in particular, the associated comorbidities. I think the behavioral comorbidities really are amenable to this type of treatment potentially. Uh, we're currently evaluating whether this NPOT uh, preparation could also reduce the frequency of spontaneous seizures. As you heard earlier today, those types of experiments are a lot more time consuming. They, they take a lot more work. So we're at the stage now where we're doing that. And so we think that this nanoparticle encapsulation strategy provides the opportunity to really sort of potentially increase the clinical translational potential of, these, of this class of molecule, but also provides a really sort of useful research tool uh, to look at the properties of these neuropeptides without the, the limitations of delivery. And it provides a really flexible strategy, right? So you could identify different neuropeptides based on their properties. Within a single nanoparticle, you could actually package more than one neuropeptide. So you could take advantage of different properties of their different neuropeptides and come up with combinations and then package it within a single nanoparticle and deliver that intranasally. So uh, that's where we're at, and I'll, I'll be, uh, I should, uh, one more slide, I guess, yeah. So just to thank uh, the guys in my lab, so pretty much all of the work I showed you today was done by a really talented assistant professor in my lab, Jennifer Wong. Uh, she's the one standing next to me in the back. And our collaborators at Mercer University uh, were instrumental in actually generating the nanoparticle preparations. 
and then our funding from NINDS and uh, AES. Thank you. Do we have any questions for Dr. Eske? Uh -huh. Thanks, Andrew. Great talk again. Oh, so the behavioral data that you had, mm -hmm. um, I noticed you didn't mention anything about sex. Uh, can you speak yeah. to sex on that? Yeah, so, so again, as, as most people tend to do, those initial experiments were all based on male mice. Uh, but that is a really important question in general, but even more so in the context of neuropeptides, right, where we know there's often big sex differences. Uh, so those are experiments that we're in the process of doing now. Yeah, but it's, it's really important to look at that. Yeah. I think we can do one more question and then we need to move to the next talk. I think I saw a hand up. Great talk, thank you. Um, uh, I'm just wondering how big of a peptide do you think that you could package into, uh, into these capsules? Yeah, I've, I've asked the same question to our collaborators. Um, according to them, we can go quite large, right? I mean, oxytocin is nine amino acids. NPY is 36. So right there, right, we've, we've spanned that range. Uh, you know, people are also using uh, nanoparticles to package small molecules and AEDs themselves, right? There's a whole literature on, you know, com clinically used AEDs being packaged in nanoparticles to help further gain entry into the brain. So I don't, I don't think, there obviously is a limitation in the size, I would imagine but there's no known limitation that I know about. My assumption is that efficiency begins to fall off after some point, but, but I don't know exactly when that point is, and, and I think we could actually package much larger molecules. Thank you so much.